when people got a good look at the one and only Firebird at General Motors Motorama, they left no doubt that Americans confidently expect this country's industrial and engineering genius to come up with tomorrow's best as it has today. For although the fabulous Firebird will never roll its wheels on public highways, Americans want the cars they do drive to reflect all the engineering imagination and unfettered experimentation that can possibly be put into test tube cars like this. For test tube car it is, a research project, just one part of a constant effort to learn still more about the generation of automotive power. For even though they have brought their piston engines to such a high state of perfection, research engineers have consistently refused to assume that piston engines are best for cars, trucks, and buses. Why not gas turbines, perhaps? Why not gas turbines? So pooling the experience gained in designing, building, and extended testing of this GM Whirlfire, the first gas turbine in the world to drive a bus, engineers designed this new Whirlfire, the first gas turbine to power an American automobile. The gas turbine has the advantage of relatively few moving parts, and all of them rotate. Important among these is this sturdy shaft that will have something that looks like fan blades at both ends. The set of blades at the one end is called the gasifier turbine. At full power, it rotates 26,000 times a minute. At the other end of the same shaft is the compressor. Its job is to compress the engine's intake air three and a half times atmospheric pressure. The blowing gases spin the turbine blade much like a pinwheel, whirling the compressor so fast it sucks in air like a giant vacuum cleaner. In the middle of the engine, accessories are mounted along the main shaft, so this combination starter generator can spin the shaft to start the engine. The other major parts of the engine are the two combustion chambers or burners. Tube-like, each fits neatly into place and operates very much like a home oil burner. Air and fuel go in one end and hot gases blow out the other. To make the wheels of the car turn, the hot gases blow on a third set of fan blades called the power turbine that turns another shaft here in the two-speed transmission. And when the brand new Whirlfire engine was tested on a dynamometer, it handily developed its rated 370 horsepower at its design speed, turning its rear axle with enough power to drive the Firebird more than 200 miles an hour. And that kind of automobile power meant a different kind of automobile body to General Motors' style. So they put their imaginations to work. And soon, from modeling clay beginnings, a scale model of the proposed Firebird body was trundled into the wind tunnel at Caltech for a series of tests to make certain that the as yet unborn Firebird would get enough air for her oxygen-hungry gas turbine engine and enough air to cool the driver's cockpit and that the Firebird would hug the ground and that she would handle well no matter what her speed or the direction of the wind. And by the time the huge wind tunnel van had started up for the last test, Fluttering tufts of wool had proved air would flow smoothly over the Firebird's gleaming skin. Still other specialists were completing their tests on the brand new kind of chassis they designed for the Firebird. A chassis itself as experimental as the Firebird's engine and the Firebird's body. A chassis whose front end is supported by a double wishbone suspension that not only eliminates the conventional kingpins, but springs as well by substituting the twist of steel rod. A chassis whose tubular rear axle is sprung on single leaf springs, supported by a unique walking beam pivoted in the center. Of course, the brakes of this high-power experimental car had to be different. 
mounted on the outside for better cooling and greater ease of maintenance. The 35-gallon needle-nose fuel tank, instead of metal, had to be built up of translucent plastic. The engine slides smoothly into the frame, and it will take but a few moments to make all the necessary connections. So finally, the work of specialists in turbines, in metallurgy, in mechanics. In fact, the work of General Motors specialists in every branch of automotive research engineering and design began at last to come together in this perfect example of the team method of modern industrial research. The driver's battleship strong yet plastic light cockpit is fitted to the chassis ahead of the first of its kind engine whose secrets are yet to be plumbed. And at last, all the Firebird's engineering perfection is ready to be encased in the gleaming glass fiber reinforced plastic cocoon of a revolutionary automobile body as aesthetically pleasing as it is aerodynamically efficient. And so it was that some time later, a specially built truck and trailer could be seen rolling over the scarred face of Arizona. It was halted finally at a barrier, man-made, in an almost trackless waste of sand and saguaro. The trailer's precious cargo was handled with extraordinary care, and kerosene was strained into the nose tank with equal caution. Technical observers were on hand. Two-way shortwave wired radio provided a constant check on the Firebird's performance. Reported directly from the car by its test driver, the helmeted, white-clad Maury Rose, whose specialized driving skill that brought him first across the finish line in three Indianapolis racing classics, could be concentrated on checking the Firebird's controls and her handling characteristics. When all instructions are given and received, when everything is in readiness and signals cleared, the hatch is closed. And Rose gives the signal even a small boy knows. The starter begins to whine. The engine comes to life. And Rose checks his air brake flap. Before gas turbines would be satisfactory power for production vehicles, research has a lot of work yet to do. But that's the job of this car and its engineers. They have to find answers to questions, practical questions. And the answers will come from research on the Firebird itself. As she runs up the miles on proving ground roadways, Engineers will try to find how best to stop her, with or without her brake flaps. Try to make her run quieter, use less fuel. They'll try to make her more responsive to her throttle, thoroughly safe, easy to service. To solve these and other problems, they'll have to find the answers to a thousand and one questions. So you can be sure that night will fall on many a day before all the answers are found before this four-wheel test tube has run the long gauntlet of dispassionate, coldly analytical, impartial research, General Motors applies to any experimental development.